We're going to go ahead and get started on this next session. Thanks, everybody, for coming and staying. Uh, we'll, we'll get moving quickly for time's sake. So we'll have four speakers talking about various applications of genomic medicine in, in the clinic. Uh, so Heather Hampel is going to start off, uh, and I'll introduce the next speakers as they come. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm trying to set my timer here. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to, um, in the next 10 minutes, tell you about two large studies going on at the James that are related to cancer and precision medicine. And some, uh, the first one, in fact, is really just to kind of support precision medicine because it's a biorepository. So that's Total Cancer Care, which opened two years ago in January of 2013 at the James. And it is a protocol that um, started first at the Moffitt Cancer Center um, down in Florida. And we were the second site, and there are now 11 hospitals throughout the United States that are all using the same protocol. And we all roll up into one consortium called Orion the Oncology Research Information Exchange Network, with the hope that um, because of precision medicine, we all may have so few patients who have a lung cancer with a specific mutation that we're trying to target, but together the 11 hospitals will have strength in numbers and we'll be able to uh, more quickly identify patients for pharmaceutical trials and clinical trials on specific tumor types with specific molecular underpinnings. So the protocol on consent is very broad. It involves lifetime consent of the patient. It allows us to collect biospecimens, uh, but no additional risk to the patient. So they, we can only get blood if they have a clinically indicated blood draw already um, ordered. Um, if they go to surgery, we, if there's any remnant tissue, we're allowed to collect that. We have the ability to recontact the patients once a year as needed to check on their health. Um, and for, to offer them participation in other research studies. We have the ability to request biospecimens from previous procedures, even outside of this hospital. So if we want a paraffin block from a surgery they had three years ago, um, that's allowed with the protocol. And it has very um, aggressive commercialization language. It's a little frightening. The legal group here approved it, which basically says that OSU can make money from their samples and clinical data, and they cannot. And you might think no one would consent to that, but you'll see that we have very, very high consent rate. So it's facilitating research, and one of the most powerful parts of this protocol is that it has a companion honest broker protocol through the information warehouse at OSU. And the information warehouse at OSU is the only IRB-approved honest broker at OSU WMC. And what they, um, they trust them to completely de-identify the patients so that if a researcher wants samples from total cancer care and doesn't need any PHI, you do not have to get a protocol approved by the IRB, not even an exempt or an expedited protocol, because it's considered non-human subjects research because they trust that the information warehouse is completely de-identifying them. And we were allowed to have them keep the linking file for a short period of time so that if you get the samples and think, oh, I should have asked for BMI, you can come back to us a couple times in the first three months to ask for additional data. Um, and we are allowed to give you any clinical data as well, um, which gives the possibility of longitudinal studies. If you want PHI, you can get samples with PHI, but then you would need an IRB-approved protocol. Um, and uh, the only limitations uh, on this are sample size. So they said if we have a tumor that's so rare, there are less than 10 people with that tumor in all of total cancer care, that's really not de-identified. We all know who those six people are with that rare tumor. So for them, you would need a full protocol. And they um, defined uh, the, the complete genome sequencing as being identifiable. So we think anything short of that, which includes exome sequencing, is allowable based on this wording. Um, so if you were going to do a full whole genome, you would need an IRB-approved protocol, but if you were going to do an exome or anything short of that, you would not need an IRB-approved protocol. All the data in the electronic medical record, IHIS, is theoretically available uh, with the limitation that many things are in uh, text and natural language processing is not where it needs to be. So path reports, for example, are really important and very hard to pull electronically. Um, so we're pulling a lot of the path data from the tumor registry instead of the electronic medical record. But the idea then, again, is that this is a rapid tool to quickly identify patients eligible for a clinical trial. Um, the benefits to the researchers are this access to more complete and higher quality specimens. The samples are being banked at Nationwide Children's currently in their biopathology center, um, which it was the first CAP certified biorepository in the country and was the TC or is the TCGA bank. 
Uh, there's no cost to OSU investigators for the accrual process, the sample collection, and at this time we're actually not charging for withdrawals. So if an investigator wants to use samples, there's no charge for that as well. That's all being underwritten by the James. In fact, we're also in talks, the whole Orion network is, to get genomic profiling on the tumors so that that data is available and would be able to be requested too, and that would also be at no cost. If some investigator wants something in addition to what we're collecting, they can. Uh, we have an addendum consent where we could get an additional sample type. For example, we're getting uh, blood DNA, blood plasma, blood serum, and then the fresh frozen tumor and normal adjacent tissue. But maybe an investigator, we've talked to some people in thoracic, thoracic who might want some nasal brushings. As long as there's no risk, you can ask for that additional sample. You can't ask on a one-off basis, but you can say, okay, for everyone with lung cancer, we're going to get a nasal brushing. Anything above and beyond what the James has decided to collect, that disease team would have to pay for. But it can be done. Uh, this is accrual, and I can tell you on our two-year anniversary last month, we hit 15,000 patients enrolled in total cancer care. Um, so accrual is not a problem. Uh, patients in uh, the Columbus area are very, very happy to participate in the study, and our withdrawal rate is very low. It's less than 10 people of the 15,000 have withdrawn in the last two years. We are consenting in GI oncology, thoracic, breast, gynoc, sarcoma, CNS, GU, melanoma, thyroid, neuroendocrine, and radonc. We are going to launch in hematology within the next three months, and we are actively trying to make sure more patients are consented preoperatively. Uh, by getting permission, we have an amendment in so that we can start accruing in the outpatient ambulatory clinic, the OPAC. This is where a lot of patients come preoperatively to get clearance for their surgery. Um, so we want to try and get most patients enrolled before their surgery so that we can get more tissue. We're averaging a 92% consent rate, um, so that's how many people agree on their first approach. Some, we are allowed to approach them up to three times. If they're still thinking about it at the third time, we don't approach them again. We consider that a decline. And this is all tracked in the electronic medical record. So those of you who are clinicians here at OSU, when you pull up a record in IHIS, the top of the record, you'll see that research active flag. If it says it's active and you double click on it, it will tell you if your patient's in total cancer care. It's already helped me on a patient where I needed some additional testing on tumor. She happened to be in total cancer care. I happened to be lucky the tissue was available. We got a release from her and sent it off for testing and we were able to find out that she had actually carny triad because she had hypermethylation of her SDHC promoter on her tumor. So um, it's been very useful already um, in some cases clinically. Um, for tissue, that's lagged behind. You'll see we have slightly less than 4,000 tissue samples, and that's fresh frozen tumor or normal adjacent. We're actively working on ways to improve this by moving our accrual team around so that they get more people preoperatively, but more and more research can be done on paraffin, and so we're also trying to make sure that where we don't have fresh frozen, we do have paraffin, um, since so many studies can be done off paraffin these days. Fluid would be our blood samples, and we run maybe 50% on this. And one of our uh, considerations to improve the amount of germline DNA we have is to potentially get a mouthwash sample at the time of accrual, since there's no additional risk with that. The trouble is so many patients come here for a second opinion and never come back, so we don't have a blood draw. Um, and that's less useful for our researchers. If you would like these samples, you simply go to eRAMP on our website and choose the uh, BSSR button. There's a bunch of buttons. And then you can uh, fill out, if you're writing a grant and you just want to know how many cases of melanoma we have, you can do the fe feasibility form and we'll tell you how many for your grant application. If you've already got your funding and you want the samples, you actually fill out the application form with the agreement and the samples will get pulled and transferred to you with whatever data you requested. And so there's a committee here that approves those, but they generally, it's done by email and it's a rather quick turnaround on requests. So our next steps, we're going to try and work on an electronic web-based consenting to help get more patients enrolled, so it's not all face-to-face -face consenting. Um, and we're really working on the data component so that someday you'll be able to log in and yourself see how many patients we have with this and such cancer. Um, so you won't have to put in a fe feasibility request. It'll be very transparent to our researchers what we have, potentially not only here, but at the other 10 hospitals that are part of Orion. Um, so switching gears to the Ohio Colorectal Cancer Prevention Initiative, this is a statewide study that's being funded completely by Pelotonia, the cycling event here that raises money to end cancer, um, and 100% of those funds come to research at the James. 
And this is a project where this is the largest project funded, and the idea was to give back to the entire state of Ohio since we have riders from all over the state and beyond. Um, so the original goal was to accrue 4,000 colorectal cancer patients from throughout the state and 8,000 of their first degree relatives. We started in January of 2013 at OSU and rolled out over time at all the outside hospitals. Um, accrual didn't go as fast as we had hoped, so we've amended our goal to 3,000 patients, which we will definitely hit in four years. We're at 2,500 currently. Um, so project one is universal screening for Lynch syndrome, so that's the project I work on, and that's screening all of these tumors to see who is more likely to have a hereditary cancer syndrome. Project two is using those leftover samples as a biorepository, which again, anyone researching colon cancer can ask us to use them, and we have clinical data and specimens stored, including tumor DNA and normal adjacent tissue DNA. And then project three is Electra Pascat's project, which is to increase adherence to colorectal cancer screening among the relatives of all of these patients with colon cancer. Even the ones who don't have a hereditary cancer syndrome have a relative risk of two or three for getting colon cancer, and so they get a personalized prescription for when they need to start colonoscopy, how frequently they need to go, and they get randomized to uh, patient navigators. I'm out of time, so I'll go quickly, but we're in 51 hospitals throughout the state. These are 50 mile radiuses around those 51 hospitals, uh, showing whoops, that we have coverage of most of the state. We have patients enrolled from 84 of the 88 counties in the state of Ohio at this time. Uh, this is a busy slide with some results, but at this point, uh, when I pulled this, we had uh, about 23 patients on, 1,700 had all of their testing completed, and if you funnel through the tumor testing to the gene testing, uh, we had 63 patients with Lynch syndrome, and then some patients who have proficient mismatch repair who should not have Lynch syndrome are getting full panels. These have been donated by Myriad Genetics, so we're not paying for them. And we have 31 additional positives through that arm for other hereditary cancer syndromes. And everyone who's positive gets free genetic counseling, and their at-risk relatives get offered free genetic counseling and testing for the mutation that we found in their family. These are the relatives that have been tested um, so far, and it was 141 relatives. This is up uh, over 200 now, and we have approximately 100 positive and a little over 100 negative relatives and more pending. So this continues to climb. It trails behind the – this is the prescription from Electra's group that they get online that tells them exactly when to start their colonoscopy and how frequently to go. And they are following up with them at 12 months to see if they did their colonoscopy and what polyps were removed and if they were precancerous so that we can show we actually prevented cancers in the state of Ohio. We already have estimates that will save several thousand lives and over $30 million in costs to the state through this study. This is her navigation activities, and so we push the patients from our study to her arm, at which point anyone who said, yes, you can call me about additional studies, gets called and offered participation in the colon screening study. And that's the, uh, this is just the biorepository, and almost everyone says yes, that we can use their leftover samples for the biorepository. You'll see 96.5% do. So again, our Midwestern population is very inclined to participate in research in biorepositories. So these samples are all around and can be requested by anyone with any interest in colon cancer research. In fact, we're just doing a collaboration with Nationwide Children on the very earliest colon cancer patients. This is the first patient we diagnosed. He was a 47-year-old with colon cancer who had an extensive family history of colon and other cancers. His father died at 63. His grandfather died in his 40s. Um, and we diagnosed him. This is a family picture with several of his aunts and his grandmother. Every single person in that photo died of cancer. This is me at his family reunion last summer where I tested uh, upwards of 35 of his at-risk relatives for Lynch syndrome and was able to tell the ones that were positive that they could benefit from increased surveillance that would keep them from getting cancer. And those that were negative could follow the American Cancer Society guidelines for cancer screening starting colonoscopy at 50 and going every 10 years. So this should just put a face on what we're doing, very um, personalized precision medicine that can save lives. Thank you very much. So thanks, Heather. That was a great talk. Uh, I, I let her go over time because I thought it was really interesting that you should all hear that. Uh, two really great points to make from that. Uh, comprehensive translational research, the TCC. Uh, it's a resource that's available. Uh, and number two, uh, making a real impact on, on Ohio lives with the uh, 
OCCPI. And I will catch up on time, don't worry. So what I want to talk to you about is an opportunity to use new types of testing strategies to help treat patients with cancer. And so that's molecular diagnostics, new tests, and guiding therapy decisions and get, getting access to new therapies. Uh, and in the past 50 years, we've, we've seen a really neat trend and change in drug development. Uh, and it's really going from the lab to the clinic. So uh, the way we've looked at cancer over the past 100, 150 years, uh, going from a literal microscope to now a genetic microscope today, uh, and, and really being able to move from the laboratory discovery, so this is an example of one of the first smart drugs in cancer uh, targeting this gene in leukemia, and, and now uh, you can see the gap from discovery in the lab to treatment in patients, uh, literally eight years, three years, and what, I'm going to give you an example of one that's in two years, uh, and, and that's just phenomenal. So it's a, it's a terrific time to be doing cancer research, uh, and we're making a, a tremendous impact. So our mission uh, is utilizing genomics or other high throughput modalities to improve care for patients with advanced cancer. And we want to go from patients understanding the genetics, the somatic genetics of their cancer, to therapy decisions or novel therapy development, understanding how those therapies work in those patients in terms of response, but also understanding that cancer is a, a tricky disease and, and a single therapy often is not effective uh, there's very few instances where that happens, uh, and understanding how cancer becomes resistant, and then thinking about rational combinations to eradicate cancer, much like the way we've sought to eradicate other diseases like HIV and tuberculosis, which are also sneaky diseases that find ways to get around therapy. So two simple goals, what's the right drug, and how can we improve that therapy? So I'll walk you through a couple steps of this process going from patients to the, the goal of, of combination therapies. Uh, so one example uh, is a patient uh, that we had profiled uh, about three and a half years ago uh, in a clinical tumor sequencing study at the school up north before I moved to Ohio State. Uh, and we discovered uh, a number of gene abnormalities in a family of receptors called fibroblast growth factor receptors. And uh, these are gene fusions, so here depicted uh, with an FGFR gene receptor with another uh, gene somewhere in the genome. And basically all of these rearrangements function to make a monster gene or fusion or chimera uh, that functionally activates that gene target and drives cancer cell growth and metastasis. So FGFR fusions going from patient discovery uh, to perhaps a new target for therapy. And so now that we've identified this target to take it to the clinic uh, or take it from this patient to the lab and back to the clinic, uh, we need to find these patients. And so uh, today when we evaluate patients like uh, Dr. Veer talked about, uh, we're looking for somatic defects or alterations that can be targeted. Uh, so gene fusions like FGFR, other mutation types, other alterations in the cancer, and we've devised several ways, uh, commercial entities, academic cancer hospitals. Uh, different testing strategies, either sequencing exons, sometimes sequencing introns, uh, sometimes sequencing RNA, uh, basically diagnostics to find these alterations so we can treat these patients. And so we've developed three different strategies here. Uh, I can't tell you the acronym for all these diagnostics, but they're all fire related, so Dragon, Ignite, and SparkFuse. Um, so we've submitted grants on these that we offer uh, to patients that we see in our clinic. So now, going from identifying these genes to how are we going to treat these patients in new trials and offer them these new therapies and evaluate how they benefit. So the traditional trial strategy is everyone with breast cancer and a new therapy and a standard clinical assessment. And I would say 98% of trials are still conducted that way, uh, and that's just the machine that we have available to us uh, to make that happen and test drugs. Uh, the new strategies are stratifying patients if you have a pre-test hypothesis, meaning you have an idea of what you want to target, uh, who's most likely to benefit. Uh, you have to have a biomarker, that diagnostic. And so uh, two examples are, uh, this would be a disease-based approach. For example, everyone with lung cancer tested and then stratified to a different treatment based on their genetics. 
Uh, so an example here we have here is a, a trial for a gallbladder or cholangiocarcinoma, uh, and you get an FGFR inhibitor if you have an FGFR fusion. Uh, a third example here uh, is a so-called basket trial where we're a little more open than just a gene and a disease. Uh, we're actually allowing patients with any cancer with a specific gene alteration to enter the study. Uh, so we're, we're going beyond the, the tissue of origin, but more what's the genetic driver. So I'll give you an example of that. Uh, and this is a pan-FGFR inhibitor, panatinib, uh, that we have open in a clinical trial uh, for any cancer with an FGFR activating mutation. So that's therapy and response. So this trial opened about 10 months ago. Uh, we've accrued about five patients. We're opening this trial uh, at School Up North as well, where I have friends and colleagues, but I can't say the name. And uh, so this trial, unselected patients, they undergo clinical tumor sequencing in real time, uh, both here and there. Uh, they're consented if they have a, a, a mutation. There's two groups, one focus on FGFR, another focus on some other discovery cohort. And then all the patients have blood, serial blood, tumor biopsies before and after uh, progression. Because uh, we're also wondering about drug resistance. And so this is uh, supported initially about two years ago by Pelotonia and the drug company that's working with us to get it up and running. Uh, and now we've submitted a, uh, about to submit a grant this Friday about that as well. So acquired resistance. So we know what's gonna happen. Uh, we're observing it in patients that are getting FGFR inhibitors. Uh, so this is a patient uh, with a FGFR fusion, cholangiocarcinoma, uh, received an FGFR inhibitor. Her blood markers went from high to low. Uh, her tumor responded on CAT scans, but eventually she developed resistance. Her disease was growing, new lesions, old lesions coming back, tumor marker, uh, and we were able to uh, identify uh, a novel mutation that could confer resistance to that inhibitor. So we can now go back to the drawing board about FGFR fusions and either build a better drug uh, or perhaps offer a therapy that can circumvent that resistance uh, mechanism. So that's the last slide, so I've hopefully I've caught up on a little bit of time. Uh, so the idea being going from patients to genes, to therapies, responses, resistance, and hopefully novel combinations uh, in, in, the, in the vein of HIV and tuberculosis and, and other examples like pediatric ALL, which has done the same. Uh, and so uh, we have opportunities now for novel targets to discover, uh, diagnostics to identify patients, uh, trials that have to change, to accommodate these new strategies. So again, most trials don't do this. Uh, new questions about combination therapy will arise, uh, and uh, new challenges ahead for us. Uh, immunogenomics, uh, immunotherapy is very exciting and effective. We have to find a way to integrate what we do in genomics with that. Uh, new strategies for testing, and then the biggest challenge is data sharing, uh, and, and that uh, can be a, 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 huge, a huge boon on uh, uh, discovery. So. So we'll move on to the next. This is our team. They did every, all the work. Um, Amy? So Amy's gonna talk to us about genetics in cardiovascular disease. Great, thanks. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna be sharing with you a little bit more of a taste of kind of clinical medicine in the precision medicine arena, and hopefully also sharing with you how um, patients who participate in research can then really feed back to our clinics to be able to deliver precision medicine for the patients that I work with a lot um, with colleagues here in the room here at Ohio State, specifically at the Ross Hart Hospital. So the condition I'm going to be focusing on today is called familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH. And I'm very passionate about this condition because it's severely underdiagnosed. We do see um, very severe early presentations of heart disease in many of these patients that can completely be present prevented. So this is very important to identify and diagnose. It is the most common cause, genetically, of premature coronary artery disease. And this is because individuals who have this condition are exposed to lifelong exposure of high LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, in their bloodstream, building up atherosclerotic plaque 
at a very young age. It's also an autosomal dominant condition. These variants are typically inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, so you are going to see a high 50% risk for all first degree relatives. Um, we can also see very interesting presentations of homozygotes or compound heterozygotes. These are individuals who have more than one pathogenic variant predisposing them, and they, of course, as you would expect, have even a much more severe presentation of their disease. It's highly penetrant, and again, as I mentioned, highly prevalent, and newer um, exome-based sequencing studies correlating with high cholesterol levels have shown that likely even as many as one in approximately 200 individuals may have a variant in a gene predisposing to FH and also have the phenotype that goes along with it. And we know there's well over half a million people in this country alone with the condition, probably less than 10% of which are actually diagnosed. It gives a very high risk. So for patients who are not treated and they don't know they have this and is really oftentimes a silent condition until an event happens like a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, uh, there's a 20-fold increased risk for heart disease in these patients if they are not treated. Again, in both men and women. And many still, unfortunately, do present with disease. I wanted to put up these screening recommendations for anyone to raise awareness about the LDL cholesterol value that you should know. And so for those of us who work with adult patients, that's going to be an LDL over 190. For kids, it's a little bit lower, so over 160. But if you see this level, FH needs to be considered for these individuals. This um, graphic shows the genetic underpinnings, really kind of the molecular pathophysiology of this condition. And most mutations, you can see here uh, the LDL particles there with the yellow. The ApoB is the ligand that actually binds the LDL particles to the green LDL receptor on the surface of the liver cell or hepatocyte to really um, promote endocytosis of these molecules. And any genes that are in this pathway can potentially have a mutation that predisposes to this pathway not working right. The most common are, are multiple different types of variants that occur in the LDLR gene affecting that protein, affecting how it can even get to the surface of the liver cell or how it can bind these, uh, how it can bind these molecules to remove them from the bloodstream. Interestingly, the PCSK9 enzyme, which I'll uh, connect with a little bit later in the talk is um, a problem if you see a gain of function mutation because when this enzyme is overactive, you have too much degradation of the LDL receptors and then those aren't working as well as they should be on the cell surface and you can also end up with too high of cholesterol. So when we see patients in the clinic, it can be sometimes difficult to diagnose, though, because just like in most uh, genetic conditions we work with, there is a lot of variability in expression how these patients present. This is, of course, due to likely other genetic variations, both risk and protective variants, as well as other certain uh, environmental factors that patients may have. And so you can he see here with these bell-shaped curves really the spectrum of cholesterol values that might be seen in people without FH here in the turquoise. And then for heterozygous FH in the yellow, even you can see what wide distributions there may be based on additional genetic background. And then uh, more rarely there in this particular study, there, there weren't as many patients, of course, with the more rare homozygous FH. But again, you see a very wide spectrum in what these patients look like. So this brings me actually to the patient that came to our clinic, and this was a 51-year-old African-American male, and he had a past medical history including high blood pressure. He also had a past medical history of elevated cholesterol that he knew about from about his teenage years, and admittedly he said it had not been, he really didn't stick to his uh, medication, he wasn't really as adherent as he should have been for several reasons that I'll get into. Um, unfortunately, at the age of 51, he developed chest pain, he was playing basketball, he underwent extensive testing, including catheterization, and was found to have very diffuse extensive coronary artery disease and required um, getting a drug eluding stent here at the Ross Hart Hospital. Now, he had never been a smoker, but still presented at 51, early onset for a male for heart disease. His physical examination from head to toe really didn't show any physical fi findings of FH. Um, sometimes you can see cholesterol deposits it's in the eyes, on certain tendons throughout the body. He did not have that, which is one of the um, markers to meet diagnostic criteria based on clinical findings. But you can see here, these are his baseline lipid panel when he presented with his heart disease. And if you remember that 190 number for his LDL, obviously this is over 100 points above this, um, so this is definitely a person we would be suspecting FHN. 
Now, um, for our pharmacogenetics friends here in the audience, uh, this patient had reported, unfortunately, uh, definitely significant side effects to his previous statin medications. He had actually tried multiple, at least three different medications. All of them um, caused him to have myalgias, and they resolved when the statin was held. There was one drug in particular, rosuvastatin, that he had not yet tried, so the lipid clinic here was really trying to manage his therapy to get him on point where he needed to be for his target cholesterol values. He was on some other medications, azetamibe and colcevalam, um, and given his history of statin intolerance, they did a really full workup, made sure from the neuromuscular colleagues that they could try this uh, statin medication or a new statin medication again. It was felt to safe to start that, so he was started on that, as well as his other medications. Now, he progressed. This wasn't a good enough therapy regimen for him, and he progressed, had additional chest pain, ended up requiring a second drug-eluting stent placed in another vessel. And on lipid recheck, you can see his LDL cholesterol went down a little bit, but still not enough. These patients are recommended to cut their LDL in half is the target, um, if not far less than 100. So he's still not by any means where he needs to be. So his Crestor, his new statin was increased, again rechecked with the neuromuscular team. They said, okay, why don't you try to bump it up a little bit more since he's still not at goal, which they did. Then the muscle aches and pains um, came in and the medication had to be reduced back down. So this really points to the importance of all the novel therapies uh, that we need for patients because many patients cannot get to the proper therapy or treatment, uh, not only with cancer, but also with heart disease that they need based on our current regimens. And one recent study even found that only really one in five patients with this disease can get to their target goal where they need to be with medications that were currently available. So there have been a lot of clinical trials. Some of our patients here have even participated in these clinical trials, have even gone to the FDA and testified to get approval of new medications. Um, one of which, very exciting, that really came out for the first time last year in 2015, so still relatively new, are PCSK9 inhibitors. And this was um, really kind of hot topic. Uh, for everyone out there who is interested in learning about lipid-lowering therapies. And these are indicated specifically in the drug guidelines for patients with FH. Um, one is approved for patients with homozygous, both are approved for patients with heterozygous, and these are really for patients just like this person who cannot get to where they need to be with current therapies alone. A lot of studies continue to go on looking at these agents to look at outcomes, and there's been a lot of talk about uh, the cost effectiveness, economics, uh, because these are very expensive medications. And so some of the insurance companies are even coming back and requiring that a patient have a genetically proven diagnosis of this condition before they are able to access the drug. So this uh, slide here summarizes the most up-to-date recommended from the American Heart Association treatment regimen for these patients. And you can see he had already been on one drug, a statin. He had already been on two drugs, including his azetamibe. He had already been on three drugs, uh, wrapping in his bile acid sequestrant. And so really what was left for this patient as an option was one of these newly approved PCSK9 inhibitors. And actually, the first time we met him, these drugs weren't even out on the market yet. Uh, so we really, uh, in collaboration with our lipid colleagues here were, were worried about, you know, what next could be done for this patient. So we saw him um, throughout the course of all of this. The lipid clinic referred him to our genetics clinic, and you've seen a pedigree by Heather. This is another pedigree, one that we took um, on him in our clinic when we evaluated him. And this pedigree was really interesting and gets to some of the points I was describing previously about variable expression in these patients and how um, each patient is so unique. Because even in his family, both of his parents were still living. They were 75, neither one of which had any diagnosed coronary artery disease. Now, he did say that his mother had been on medication for cholesterol, so that was, of course, suspicious, and his maternal grandfather did die of a reported myocardial infarction in his sleep. Um, no first-degree relatives, though, that were in his pedigree with any known diagnosed coronary artery disease. And as you can see, though, he has a lot of relatives potentially at risk, including a daughter and a granddaughter and some nieces and other family members. So during that visit, we discussed some of these novel therapy options that hopefully could help this patient. Um, and it was interesting because given what his pedigree looks like, given his lack of physical features, we weren't really sure how to classify him um, into what type of FH he was. 
So we proceeded with genetic testing, and it did come back positive for a pathogenic variant in the LDLR gene. And this is a frame shift mutation that we know would cause um, a truncated LDL receptor to be made. Um, this particular variant in particular had actually been seen in other patients with FH, so we felt that we had definitely found um, our underlying genetic etiology in this patient. So coming back full circle then to his therapy, this really luckily helped with our colleagues that we were working um, with this patient in a multidisciplinary fashion have him access some additional therapies he needed, including his PCSK9 inhibitor. He ended up going through all the pathways with the pharmacist team, getting authorization to be able to access this drug, and he now currently is on one of these new PCSK9 inhibitors. You can see the power of genetic testing, too, and just how it relates to the at-risk family members. We have a lot of people in this pedigree who need to figure out their genetic status. We need to learn what side of the family was this inherited from so that we know the right relatives to get plugged into genetic testing and prevention. And again, um, just stressing how important it is for the next generation to know about this information and how powerful that can be, what we know is, say, for his daughter and even his granddaughter, it's recommended that individuals who are at risk for this condition be tested as young as two years of age. And again, this is because of the lifelong exposure to LDL cholesterol that they don't need to have if we know that they have this condition. And population studies that have followed, this particular data is out of the Netherlands, but followed individuals who have had the proper therapy that they needed, um, being treated with a statin, and you can see that's actually in the dark blue line at the top, reach the same overall risk um, as the general population does compared to those individuals who have FH and don't have a statin. And you can see how um, worse those individuals fare as far as how long they can survive without having a cardiac event if they don't have the proper therapy. We then were able to um, enroll this patient back into research. So kind of um, hopefully you can see how the research can be brought to the clinical um, side of things, and then we actually help get patients back into research so we can continue to learn even more about them. Ohio State is now a site for the Cascade FH Registry. This is a nationwide registry of patients with FH, multiple sites across the country. So now he is enrolled, and again, very similar to these types of registries, looking at outcomes, how does this patient fare on the PCSK9 inhibitor, do other family members get tested, um, so that we can learn and do better by future patients also with this condition. So thanks for your attention. Great talk. Thank you. So Anna Morales is going to now talk to us about an ongoing and getting bigger study on dilated cardiomyopathy. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm a co-investigator of the DCM Precision Medicine Study here at OSU. I am also a genetic counselor and an assistant professor in the Division of Human Genetics. And today I will talk about the DCM Precision Medicine Study, which is an expansion of the um, already existing dilated cardiomyopathy research study, now with a $12 million NIH grant um, to fund a multi-site uh, study that I will present today. So in our group, we do genetic research in idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, which is shown here. It's a condition in which uh, the heart left ventricle becomes enlarged and the ejection fraction is low. This leads to heart failure, which is a disease leading to enormous morbidity and mortality in the United States. The most common cause of dilated cardiomyopathy is coronary artery disease, but once coronary artery disease is ruled out and other rare causes are ruled out as well, we are left with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, which is dilated cardiomyopathy of unknown cause. And it is this uh, patient population that has been a substrate for ongoing genetic research. And to this date, we have vast literature data supporting a genetic basis for DCM. However, despite all the progress we've made, um, several key issues still remain. So the first issue is, 
what is the proportion of familial dilated cardiomyopathy? So if you go off the street and ask uh, providers, you would probably get a consensus that familial dilated cardiomyopathy is uncommon. And for that reason, um, in our experience, providers rarely evaluate for familial DCM. And the literature, the range of reports of familial disease can be as low as 5% to as low as 50%. Percent. So in our study, we would like to be more precise with the hypothesis that 35% of idiopathic DCM is familial. And what this means is if you have a patient with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy in front of you and you take a family history or screen the family members, there's a 35% chance that you will identify familial disease. The next issue is how many individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy have known genetic cause. So this sort of stems from the first issue. And in this case, the uh, issue is that the genetic basis of DCM is currently underappreciated, which means that genetic testing is not uh, used to its full potential. And we hypothesize that uh, similar proportions of familial and non-familial DCM will have genetic cause. Again, what this means is that you don't need a reported family history on paper to support the possibility that genetics could be involved. Your patient could have a reportedly negative family history and still have a de novo or some new unknown genetic variant that predisposes to cardiomyopathy. The next issue is, are the genetics of DCM similar across diverse populations? So we all know that dilated cardiomyopathy is considered to be more common, morbid, and lethal in African ancestry. If you look at the literature, you will see that African and Hispanic ancestry DCM genetics data is scarce. So with our study, we hypothesize that similar proportions across populations will have identifiable genetic cause. Next is, what is the best approach for genetic counseling of these patients? So I already mentioned that first degree relatives of individuals with DCM are at increased risk for DCM. And per guidelines, cardiovascular screening is recommended for these individuals. However, the challenge begins with the fact that it is the patient in front of you who is responsible to communicating this information to the family members who are reportedly healthy and unaware of their risk. And in our experience, this communication process is difficult, but it has not been formally studied. So in our study, we will use a communication tool that will hopefully assist patients uh, in communicating risk with their relatives about DCM. Our recruitment targets for this study include 1,300 individuals with DCM or ProVans, and the uh, recruitment is uh, targeting uh, specific ethnicities and racial groups. So we're aiming for 560 of European ancestry, 560 of African ancestry, and 180 individuals of Hispanic ancestry, which in turn are broken down into 40 of African ancestry, 40 of European ancestry, and 100 of Native American ancestry. We will also enroll their family members for a total of 5,400 of those family members. So the overall study plans to recruit 6,700 individuals. This study is a collaboration of the DCM consortium that we created here at OSU. It's a multi-site investigator group that is designed to promote and facilitate um, collaborations. Currently, the DCM Precision Medicine Study is the only study because it's the first uh, hosted by the DCM Consortium. We have 12 sites around the United States and they are shown here. Those sites have been chosen for their ability to identify appropriate candidates with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy and also because they are located in strategic sites that can recruit ethnically and racially diverse populations. OSU is the lead coordinating and regulatory site for this study. So going into each aim in greater detail, the first one is determining the frequency of familial and non-familial DCM. So first we will enroll the probands. They will be consented at one of the 12 sites. We will get all the cardiovascular data. We will also deploy annual surveys, one at baseline and in each year for the duration of the study. And this survey will be to assess genetics, knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, and hopefully track how this evolves throughout the uh, participation in the study. We'll also get blood samples, including uh, CLIA-compliant uh, DNA samples, as well as lymphocytes, plasma, and serum 
specimens for future biomarker studies. We will then enroll their willing family members. OSU will be primarily responsible for this. Um, we have IRB approval to be able to get family member contact information from that first individual enrolling in the study from the ProBand. With that contact information, our team at OSU can go ahead and recruit the family members for study. And their job is to facilitate this enrollment. They can enroll at one of the 12 sites if that's uh, more feasible, or they can use our phone and mailing uh, procedures for enrollment um, of site. We will want their cardiovascular data as well. So if they report to be affected, we will get all of those records to confirm their diagnosis. If they report themselves to be unaffected, we will recommend that they pursue cardiovascular screening to rule out silent structural disease. And they can do this in one of two ways. They can go to one of the 12 sites and obtain clinical screening covered by the study or they can go through their regular doctor and use regular insurance channels to get this screening. We'll also get all of that data and a blood sample for DNA testing as well. Once we have everything we need for this aim, we will conduct pedigree analysis, which will be a formal assessment of whether the condition in that individual is familial or not. The next aim is conducting genetic testing. So we will use exome sequencing in the proband and the family members who are affected. This will facilitate future ongoing novel gene discovery. From that exome uh, data, we will pull out data from 40 known, already published DCM genes that we estimate account for 40% of disease. The people who test negative for the 40 known DCM genes will be highly informative for uh, gene discovery. We will then proceed and report results from those 40 genes to ProBands and all the family members who uh, need testing based on the ProBands results, and we will do this via formal genetic counseling. The third aim is evaluating the impact of a communication tool in the update of uh, clinical recommendations, and for this we have developed uh, a communication tool that we have uh, titled Heart Talk. And the way this works is uh, at enrollment, at baseline, the probands will be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receiving or not receiving this uh, Family Heart Talk communication tool. Then we start working on recruiting the family members and getting all the clinical screening data for cardiovascular uh, evaluation. And at 12 months, one year post-enrollment, we will have our first endpoint, which will be counting the number of family members who actually pursued screening. And obviously, we expect to see differences based on whether or not that proband used family heart talk. At that time, we will also report genetic testing results. And at 27 months, the second endpoint of this aim will be uh, calculating family member adherence to the recommendations that we made during genetic counseling based on their test results. So in summary, um, our study will enable precision medicine for DCM. Um, I particularly think that the genetic counseling process in racially and ethnically diverse populations will be highly informed by new data allowing better assessment of familial disease risk, the impact of genetic variants on disease, and risk communication among families. And with that, I will end my presentation and thank all of the collaborators that are involved in this study. If anyone has any questions, I have a first question to start off with for you guys. I, I think all of these presentations are really good examples of translational research, uh, leveraging some basic science knowledge and know-how to clinical applications. So maybe the three of you can just comment on any barrier. What are the biggest barriers for you to accomplish what you're doing? And maybe you can share that with the, the group. Um, I think probably all three of us would say IRB, um, <laughs> so that's a challenge. Specifically in my study, which is similar to Anna's, they uh, did not allow us at first to have the probands give us the names and contact numbers of their relatives. They wanted us to 
give the probands a piece of paper to hand to their relative and the relative could mail it back in, which doesn't work. Um, and so it took quite a bit of convincing, actually. Um, to, and and the, luckily, there's an NCI-funded colon family registry that had used that model, and we were able to show them that that had worked and multi-center been funded and, um, and get them to allow us to do it that way here because you won't get any relatives otherwise. So lots of issues like that, especially mm -hmm. with germline genetic testing. I, I would definitely second Heather's assessment of the IRB being one of the most difficult barriers to assess, uh, but to elaborate on that, I would also say that the multi-institutional component of obtaining regulatory approval is extremely challenging because every institution will have different rules and you want to implement a single protocol and, you know, communicating genetics and this um, innovative and somewhat controversial idea of obtaining family members' contact information can be widely uh, different among different sites and how they accept it. I'll focus more on the clinical, on a clinical answer since you guys talked a little bit more about um, IRB. So for me, when providing genetic counseling to a patient, um, it can be very difficult because even though you can tell them you test positive for this mutation or this variant and you now are at increased risk, that gives them somewhat of an answer, but it's really not a precise answer, and I don't feel like I'm oftentimes necessarily at the point where I'm really giving full precision medicine, and I think by collaborating more with our research colleagues and enrolling more patients in research all the time, and now with all the technology we have for more large-scale analyses of different patients, um, hopefully we can get closer to, in even a lot of these Mendelian diseases we work, in, we work in, giving more precise risk predictions for the future, and I think matching people up more with targeted you know, treatments is just a goal that I would love to see over the course of my career, so. Other questions from the audience? So, this is more specifically for Amy. In thinking about access to the newer drugs for the familial hypercholesterolemia, um, knowing that there are some pharmacogenomic associations with statin failure and myopathies, do you think there, and I will confess, I don't know off the top of my head the penetrance of SLCO1B1 in myopathies, but do you think there's a role for preemptive genetic screening in patients for patients who will maybe fail statins up front and maybe have access sooner? Yeah. I, like you, would have to look at the data, but I do know, um, I was actually trying to connect our lipid clinic colleagues with Joe Kitzmiller. Uh, I don't know if he's here. I never met her, him in person, but um, because of the research he does here, because um, even in the Cascade FH registry data, they are seeing a significant proportion of patients that do report statin intolerance. They, we don't have genetic data on those patients, but it's definitely something that is reported. Um, whether all of those patients truly have a biological, you know, statin intolerance, I don't know. But the Lipid Clinic here ends up seeing a lot of outside referrals for very complex patients, um, patients that can't get, you know, to the full therapy they need, and they do have statin intolerance indicated as one of the common reasons for referral. Uh, you know, whether I think there might be pushback from, uh, again, the economic standpoint, and health insurance is a challenge that we deal with a lot in access for those patients, because if that's just a reported symptom and they're just clinically reporting that, maybe a pharmacogenetic test could even prove more reason for them to be able to access uh, that medication. That being said, maybe there might be patients that don't test positive that still need access. So there's lots of complicated things to think about with that, but, um, you know, just talking to Dr. Sade actually for years about preemptive testing, I think a lot of us would like to have that data, and I think the Lipid Clinic would like to have that data. Uh, so, excuse me, this question's for you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the conduct of trials where you use the genetic information at the beginning or the onset of the trial to kind of inform decision making about what uh, therapy to give. What about adaptive trials, or like adaptive signature, signature designs, where you actually conduct the trial and then, at some interim point, look at who's responding and look at the genetic information or genomic information at that point? To, are those being conducted here? There, there are several that are of that vein that are adaptive. Uh, the barriers for adaptive is that they have to be very big and they have to have a lot of real-time data, which is hard to do. Um, so if you notice the trial that I showed is a two-site trial uh, at a site that I'm very familiar with that I know can get me the data quickly, uh, but you can imagine doing a trial at 50 sites. Uh, 
the ability to have up-to-date data to make decisions at interim time points, that, that's just the, the, the big barrier uh, um, to actually do that. Is, the, is that the perfect way to do it, to make use of the small number of patients that are going to participate? Absolutely. It would maximize the, the, the resources. Uh, NCI Match is an example of that uh, large effort. Uh, they've enrolled 1,000 out of 3,000 patients' goal uh, for adult oncology. They're at a stopping point. The stopping point's going to go on for like a year and a half, right? So just to collect the data and make some decisions. So, right. But that, that would be the best way to do it, the most, most efficient. So the practical implementation in, yes, in real time. Yes, usually the, the practical barriers. There's, there's been a couple of studies that have done that, but they have these long gaps before, you know, by the time it's over, it's over. So. Right. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.